All right. Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to dive right in because 10 minutes is not very long, uh, and we've got, a lot, we've got a lot to say. We wrote a whole paper about it. Um, crowdsourcing in cultural heritage is rich in opportunities for collaboration, um, interdisciplinary research, and practice. Uh, this presentation celebrates and calls for input and expansion of a white paper that sets out current challenges and opportunities and provides recommendations for the future of crowdsourcing and cultural heritage and the digital humanities. Um, the white paper is one of the outcomes of the Collective Wisdom Project, which was supported by the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council, um, the UK-US Partnership Development Grant Scheme, under the proposal title, From Crowdsourcing to Digitally Enabled Participation, The State of the Art in Collaboration, Access, and Inclusion for Cultural Heritage Institutions. Um, as was just said earlier, we want to acknowledge our dear friend and collaborator, Megan Ferreter, who wasn't able to attend in person, but who is participating online, and uh, without whom we would not have been able to do this work. Hi, Megan. <clears throat> so, just a brief overview of what we'll talk about today. We're going to center this talk by providing a bit of additional context about the events leading up to this white paper, um, and then we'll dive right into the five recommendations we have pulled together, as well as the intractable challenges that we've identified, and then a brief invitation to participate in our period of open comment. Um, we've included our Mastodon handles as well, in case you'd like to participate in that space. Um, we're also on Twitter, but you can just find us. Um, right, so why are we talking about this? I will start with a definition. There are a number of practices that we group within the term crowdsourcing. Um, these include online volunteering, citizen science, citizen history, digital public participation, and community co-production. What it specifically does not include, however, is micro work along the lines of Mechanical Turk. This space, like many in DH, um, increasingly involves human computation, AI and machine learning, and other swiftly adapting systems that will change and already are changing how participants in crowdsourcing spaces relate to digital cultural heritage. We want to help funders, institutional leadership, and others understand these changes and to support project teams and participants. And in order to do so, we outline five recommendations for our audience to follow, as well as the uh, aforementioned intractable challenges. Um, so a quick background on the Collective Wisdom Project. We aimed for all of our activities to be designed and implemented in ways that foster an international community of practice. Um, we also aimed to gather and share state-of-the-art activity through the collaborative writing of an open access book, shown here called the Collective Wisdom Handbook, which we released in 2021. Um, we had hoped to, through our activities, emerge with a research agenda and articulate shared understandings of uh, the kinds of unsolved problems that could use the investigation of future researchers with support through future funding schemes and programs. And similarly, we, we hoped to reinvigorate networks of practitioners through our work. Um, and then finally, and I think most importantly for today's session, we wanted to release recommendations for future steps through writing and disseminating a white paper. And now, Mia is gonna dive into our recommendations. Awesome, thank you, Sam, and hi, Megan. Um, and hi, everyone else as well, obviously. Okay, so I'm going straight in. One of our recommendations is that funders should really think about supporting the sustainability of the existing and well-used platforms that we have today. Um, the situation is very different than it was a few years ago when you might have needed to make bespoke software or adapt software or adapt to different platforms and kind of have a bricolage of systems that work together. There are great platforms that exist that have huge user communities um, and great developer communities and communities of GLAMs and humanities scholars working with them. Um, so we should be supporting those. And one of the reasons for doing that is that it frees up funds for those platforms to be more innovative, for community management, community engagement, um, for us to do more interesting things with the data if we're not constantly reinventing the wheel. And some of that is asking funders and organisational leaders not to get too excited about novelty. So not being like magpies going towards the shiny, but going towards the thing that we know works, that has years of wisdom and hard work and bug reports and everything going into it. 
Um, so that means on a practical level, things like funders allowing researchers to build maintenance costs into funding proposals. Um, and also, when you're thinking about a project, go and talk to the platform owners and work with them to write something so that they can use funds to improve their documentation or improve data ingress or out egress um, or do any of the many things that are probably on their to-do list that will help make your project run even better. Um, it also allows for more funds for innovating on the user experience design in responses to changes in user expectations in the wider field. Okay, so one of our really important points is building on the existing work in things like the Europeana Impact Playbook um, to design something that's designed for busy cultural heritage professionals running projects or humanities scholars running projects um, to think about evaluation from the ground up to make sure that they can report on the things at the end of their project. You need to do work at the start, so you might think about surveys, you might think about um, the kinds of questions you want to ask. We really need to get beyond the, we had X million volunteers, we had 20,000 pages, whatever. Those numbers are impressive, or they might not be impressive if you're a smaller organization, but some of those smaller projects have incredibly profound um, impacts, as we've heard from two of the presentations today, which are sort of specialist um, projects that maybe have more niche interests, but have really, p communities have seen themselves in those projects and related very strongly to those projects. And they, that impact isn't reflected in the numbers of visitors or the numbers of pages transcribed maybe, but it can be collected in other ways through the stories that we tell about the difference it's made in those lives and to those organizations. So there are practical tips like providing recipes um, and this will also help people plan uh, resources for evaluation into um, your work plan because it's really hard to find the time if you're running a project to actually step back and report effectively and meaningfully on your project because you're just so busy dealing with everything else. It's really hard for people to know before they start a project what skills they're going to need. So Megan and Sam and I probably get a lot of questions so people cornering us for a coffee and asking about this kind of thing. Um, so we propose that people support the development of a self-guided skills inventory tool. So you can look at all the skills that might be required to run a project, everything from managing your data, um, collaborating, working, managing projects, um, skills that you might not think are um, everyday, um, so that you can identify them early in a project. You can think about who needs to be in your team. Maybe you can co-opt people from elsewhere in your organization. Maybe you can work with volunteers. Um, but it also helps people get a shared, concrete understanding of what you're building together because that can be quite hard at the start when you don't really know what it is you're doing. We think communities of practice are really important. You've probably all experienced something of that at this conference. You've run into someone who's working on the same kind of problem, has had similar experiences. It's a really great way to um, reflect and learn and deepen your own experience, expand your knowledge, solve problems together. So I don't really need to tell you why that's important at an event like this, but when we go back home, when we're in our institutions, you might be the only person working on a problem. Um, those communities of practice that you establish through online connections, through informal meetups, as well as at big conferences are really important. And we think that um, funding those, supporting the development of those is a really important thing that funders could do. And that's also partly because um, we need more diverse views in this field. We need to hear from people outside the UK, US sort of corridor. Um, we need to think about how volunteering cultures reflect the cultures of society in which they occur. Um, so we need to have more conversations and um, communities of practice is one way for that to happen. And our final um, recommendation is that we think really hard about how we incorporate emergent technologies and methods. So obviously, ChatGPT means that suddenly everyone is an expert in AI, um, or has at least tried it and has an opinion and can no longer sort of go, well, I'll deal with AI when it happens because it is most definitely already here, even if it is still mostly machine learning. Um, so we need to get better at thinking about how we incorporate this, also thinking about how we say no to some technologies. Maybe it's not appropriate, maybe they will bring biases, um, or, but maybe they'll also do really good things for us. So we need to really understand what it is that we're buying into. And particularly for crowdsourcing, where there's a temptation to just throw machine learning at it, we need to think about where that really is appropriate. Um, and we also think that 
uh, we need really diverse teams, again, with different skills and to value the different kinds of skills. So technologists might not know anything about volunteer management, but everyone has something to bring to that party. All right. Um, you know, it can feel a little bit uneasy to present challenges, particularly at the end of a talk, without confirmed solutions, but we felt it was really important to point out the particularly nebulous pieces um, that even with the suggestions that we do provide uh, in the white paper, these are gonna remain some of the most challenging parts of the work that we do. Um, for example, staffing projects is difficult. Uh, it's particularly difficult to do so when some or all of the roles in a project are filled by part-time staff, uh, which is frequently the case in cultural heritage institutions. Um, values or maintenance work too, and here we specifically wanted to call out the risk of participant exploitation, even in well-resourced situations. Being consistent with the process of checking in on values throughout a project life cycle is really crucial here, and, and teams can lower this risk of exploitation by creating participant advisory boards or Bill of Rights style documentation in collaboration with volunteer communities. Um, innovation can be harmful when it is not necessary. Our field is mature. We've been doing this for a while. Good projects don't always need to be innovative and can instead follow existing models. Sustainability is a challenge, especially when coupled with innovation requirements. We've all seen the XKCD comic about dependency, um, which remains all too true. If you haven't seen it, come find me afterwards and I'll show you. Innovation can stall if a monopoly of platforms exists. Consequences here can include things like stagnation in the field due to limits for experimentation, because everybody's using the same tools and kind of doing the same thing. Who gets to frame the field? This, I think this one's so important. Whose work is legible within the frameworks we create and how does that affect work on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Too many best practices can create overhead to getting started. And here we encourage using sandboxes or hands-on workshops to lower those barriers to entry. Um, and last but certainly not least, um, what I believe on Wednesday, uh, Quinn Dombrowski referred to as the tech saviors. Um, a rapid acceleration over the past year in the availability and the quality of generative AI models will change the relationship between volunteers and data managers even further, and very likely in ways we can't yet anticipate. So we need to meet this reality with, with a mind that the potential short-term financial savings of automating the ability to summarize and reformat textual information, for example, may not be worth the loss. Um, it's yet another opportunity to operationalize values and really make sure they're widely understood amongst everyone participating in a project. All right, so finally, we want to share the link to the full white paper um, and invite you to please engage with it, leave feedback either directly on the doc or by reaching out to us directly. Um, you do need to create a PubHub account to leave comments on the doc, um, but if that's not your thing. Um, we've included also some contact emails uh, as well in our draft. And the period of comments is going to be open until September 30th. Thanks very much. <laughs>